Does this, yes, it works. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to thank uh, Hastings Law School for having this symposium and for having this panel uh, and inviting me out. Uh, so this panel is about uh, Justice Kennedy's First Amendment uh, jurisprudence, and we have three outstanding panelists. I'm going to introduce them very briefly because we want to get right into it. Uh, to my immediate uh, left is Erwin Chemerinsky, who's currently the dean of UC Berkeley across the Bay and previously was the dean at UC Irvine and has taught uh, at Duke and USC. Uh, and he just told me DePaul, and I'm told that he's written a few books and articles. <laughs> uh, to his left is Professor Ash Bhagwat, who was at Hastings for, I think, 17 years until he moved, over, moved a bit east uh, to UC Davis, and Professor Bhagwat uh, clerked for Justice Kennedy during the 92 term? 91-92. 91-92 term. And uh, all the way towards uh, the left, from my left, uh, is uh, Nadine Strassen, who uh, was the uh, head of the ACLU for many years, uh, where she litigated a number of cases that uh, came before the court and that resulted in uh, opinions by Justice Kennedy. And uh, Professor Strassen is currently uh, teaches at New York Law School. So the way we're going to set things up and proceed is as follows. Uh, each of the panelists will make remarks for about 15 minutes. Uh, then we're going to have about 15 or 20 minutes where we're going to discuss things among ourselves. Uh, and then for the final 15 minutes, I'm going to open up things uh, to the audience. And if you have any questions, uh, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Can you ask us, uh, ask us anything and everything? So we'll start off with uh, Dean Chemerinsky. Thank you. It's such an honor to be part of this distinguished panel and this terrific conference. The conventional wisdom is that Anthony Kennedy was very much a staunch advocate of free speech on the Supreme Court. To be sure, there are many majority opinions he wrote that advanced the protection of free speech. I would point as an example to the last majority opinion he wrote for the court with regard to freedom of speech, the one that's clearly advancing speech, Packingham versus North Carolina. Lester Packingham was convicted of taking indecent sexual liberties with a minor when he was in college. He was then a convicted sex offender in the state of North Carolina. North Carolina had a law that said that those who were convicted of sex crimes were not allowed to use the internet or be on any social media where minors might be present. Packingham got a traffic ticket, went to traffic court and got it quashed, and then went onto Facebook and wrote the words, God is good. Just for doing this, he was convicted of the North Carolina law because he was a registered sex offender who was impermissibly on social media. The Supreme Court declared the North Carolina law unconstitutional. Justice Kennedy wrote an opinion joined by five other justices. Justice Kennedy's opinion began in eloquent language, talking about the importance of the internet and social media as a forum for speech. It is clear that any government regulation of speech over this medium has to be subjected to exacting scrutiny. I, of course, could point to many other opinions that Justice Kennedy wrote advancing free speech. Yet I believe that the conventional wisdom is incomplete and, frankly, inaccurate. Often Justice Kennedy's opinions were not on the side of free speech. Often his votes did not advance free speech. In my remarks this morning, I want to make two points. First, when the institutional interests of the government were at stake, Justice Kennedy was not a free speech proponent. And second, some of Justice Kennedy's opinions and votes that appear to advance speech, in fact, will lead to less speech. In terms of the first point, what's striking to me is that in cases where the interests of government is government are involved, Justice Kennedy was not on the side of free speech. To pick an example, Garcetti versus Sabalas was an opinion written by Justice Kennedy in the spring of 2006. Richard Sabalas was a deputy district attorney in Los Angeles County. He believed that a witness in one of his cases, a sheriff, was lying. He did some investigation that confirmed his fears. 
He wrote a memo to the file saying this. His supervisor, actually a former student of mine, said, soften the tone of the memo. Sabalas refused to do that. He believed under Brady versus Maryland, he was required to share a copy of that memo with the defense lawyer. For doing this, he was removed from his supervisory position. He was transferred to a much less desirable location. He sued, saying that this violated his First Amendment rights. The Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, ruled against Richard Sabalas. Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court, joined by the four conservative justices who were then on the court. Justice Kennedy, writing for the court, held that there is no First Amendment protection for the speech of government employees on the job in the scope of their duties. I can point you to not just dozens, but likely hundreds of lower court cases where government employees have lost their speech claims in light of the Supreme Court's broad holding that there's no First Amendment protection for the speech of government employees on the job in the scope of their duties. This is particularly important when there are those who are whistleblowers in their department who expose wrongdoing to those who are supervisors in the department. In the year 2000, when the Rampart scandal in the Los Angeles Police Department came to light, I was asked to do a report on the LAPD. And one of the things that I learned was that those who reported misconduct by other officers might face reprisal by supervisors, by other officers. Garcetti versus Sabalas means that the officer who comes forward in that way has no First Amendment protection whatsoever. I can point to other cases, too, where when the institutional interests of the government were at stake, Justice Kennedy ruled against free speech. Take a case from a year later, Morse versus Frederick. The Olympic torch was coming through Juneau, Alaska. A high school there released its students to stand on the sidewalk and watch it come through. A high school student got together with some friends and unfurled a banner that said, quote, bong hits for Jesus. At the oral argument, Justice Souter said he had no idea what that meant. But the principal thought that it was a message to encourage illegal drug use. She confiscated the banner and suspended the student from school. The student sued and said it violated his free speech rights. The Supreme Court, in a 5-4 decision, ruled in favor of the principal in the school and against the student. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion for the court here, but Justice Kennedy was part of the majority. Chief Justice Roberts emphasized the interest of the school in discouraging illegal drug use, how it gave the school the authority to punish speech that was perceived as encouraging illegal drug use. But as Justice Stevens pointed out in dissent, it's hard to imagine that any student of the school, the smartest or the slowest, was more likely to use illegal drugs because of this banner. The banner does not have any effect with regard to drug use or the school, and yet nonetheless, Justice Kennedy was part of the majority saying that speech could be punished. Or another case about the same time that involves prisoners, a case called Beard versus Banks. What was involved here was a Pennsylvania prison regulation that prisoners in the maximum security facility could not have any printed material. They couldn't have newspapers, magazines, books. They couldn't even have family photographs. The traditional principle with regard to the constitution of prisoners is prisoners lose those rights that are necessary to effectuate incarceration. Hard to believe that taking away all printed material is necessary to effectuate incarceration. In fact, harder to think of a clearer infringement of speech than saying no access to printed material at all. But the Supreme Court upheld that regulation once more with Justice Kennedy and the majority. I'll point to one other example. And this is a case from 2010, Humanitarian Law Project versus Holder. What's involved here was a couple of groups that were involved in advocacy. One was a Sri Lankan group that was trying to advocate for more protection of rights within the country. Another was a Kurdish group that was advocating for independence. Americans wanted to be able to help these groups, 
in the Sri Lankan instance to apply for humanitarian assistance with regard to the Kurdish group to help them with regard to the independence campaign. The State Department had labeled both of these groups as terrorist groups, and the question was whether the Americans could be prosecuted for material assisting terrorist activity for helping these groups. Nothing the Americans was, were doing is in any way linked to terrorist activity. It was about getting humanitarian assistance, but using the United Nations. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court, an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, said that such speech could be prosecuted and punished as material assisting foreign terrorist organizations. It was Justice Breyer in dissent who said that under the leading Supreme Court case, Brandenburg versus Ohio, speech should be punished only if there's substantial likelihood of imminent illegal activity, and only if the speech is directed at causing imminent illegal activity. There was no evidence of this whatsoever. Indeed, Chief Justice Roberts' majority opinion didn't even cite to Brandenburg versus Ohio. Justice Kennedy was part of the majority in that case. So for those who want to think of Anthony Kennedy as a free speech justice, you need to take into account his rulings in cases like Garcetti versus Sabalas, Morse versus Frederick, Beard versus Banks, Humanitarian Law Project versus Holder. The second point that I want to make this morning is that some of Justice Kennedy's opinions or votes that seem to advance free speech, I think, actually lead to less speech. Let me again give some examples. I'll start with a case from June 27th of 2018, Janus versus American Federation. In 1977, in Abood versus Detroit Board of Education, the Supreme Court reaffirmed that no one can be forced to join a public employees union. But the court said that non-union members can require to pay the share of the union dues that go to support collective bargaining of the union. The court said non-union members benefit from collective bargaining in their wages, their hours, their working conditions. They shouldn't be able to be free riders. But the court said non-union members can't be required to pay the share of the union dues that go to support the political activities of the union. That would be impermissible compelled speech. This was the law for four decades until the Supreme Court overruled it in Janus. Justice Alito wrote the opinion for the court. Justice Kennedy was part of the five-person majority. The court focused on how it violates the free speech rights of non-union members to force them to pay the so-called agency fees, the fair share that go to support collective bargaining. Now, I certainly would question that premise. After all, the members of the union voted by majority vote to unionize, and part of democracy includes sometimes having to pay taxes even if we disagree with what they used. But if you look at it just from a free speech perspective, I am convinced that Janus is going to mean much less in the way of free speech. Because the effect of Janus is that unions are going to have far less revenue, less members, which means they're going to engage in less expressive activity. So if you look at Janus from a calculus with regard to is it going to mean more or less free speech, I think it's clearly going to mean less. Or take the case that Justice Kennedy might be most identified with in the area of freedom of speech. Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. There, of course, the Supreme Court held that corporations can spend unlimited amounts of money to get the candidates of choice elected or defeated. There's many grounds which I would question whether or not Citizens United was a desirable interpretation of the First Amendment. But I question whether it's going to lead to more speech. Now, to be sure, it means corporations are going to be able to engage in more speech. But what about the candidates who will never choose to run because of the corporate wealth that's arrayed against them? Their speech that we don't hear. What about all of the voices that are drowned out by the accumulation of corporate wealth? And this is something the court didn't take into account in Justice Kennedy's opinion. So I think when you look at cases like Janus and Citizens United, Though on surface they may seem to be a free speech case, I'm not sure they're going to really lead to more speech. Much more likely, I think it'll mean less. So when I look at Justice Kennedy's record with regard to freedom of speech, what I see is that when there was a tension between his conservative values and free speech, often it was the conservative principles that triumphed. Think of it with regard to the cases concerning the institutional interests of the United States, but also think about it when you combine 
Janus together with Citizens United. What it does is increase the power of corporations in our society and significantly decrease the power of unions. That's something conservatives favor, but not something that the First Amendment should countenance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Professor Bagua. Okay, um, I respectfully dissent. Um, I'm gonna try and convince you that Justice Kennedy was not always, but was in fact a free speech advocate. Um, but five years ago, my then TA, Matt Struer, and I published an um, article in the McGeorge Law Review on this occasion of Justice Kennedy's 25th anniversary on the court, in which we did an empirical analysis of all of the current recent justices and their votes on First Amendment issues, and we concluded that he was, in fact, the most free, free speech friendly justice currently on the court. Um, and I'm going to try and figure out here a little bit, I'm going to talk about a few cases, including Packingham, to explain why and why I am the only Democrat in the country who believes that Citizens United was correctly decided. No. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, another. two of us. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start, I wanna talk about public forum cases to start because I think they're interesting. Um, 1992, the court decided a case called um, Society for Krishna Consciousness versus Lee. Um, and the issue was the New York and New Jersey Port Authority passed regulations banning the distribution of literature or the solicitation of funds in the public areas of airports. And remember, this is pre-9-11, so the public areas of airports were much more extensive back then. There was shopping, there were restaurants, it was just as O'Connor described them as like basically a shopping mall. And this is before you go through security. Um, and the question for the court, the key question was whether or not these public spaces, which were open to anybody, um, should be treated as public forums and therefore create a strong presumption in favor of speech. The majority, um, five justices, Chief Justice Rehnquist writing, because we lost Justice O'Connor, um, said no. They said, traditional public forums are streets and sidewalks, airports haven't been around, so they can't be traditional. Think about that. Um, <laughs> um, designated forums are forums the government intentionally opens up to speech, but obviously the New York Port Authority is not doing that because they're banning speech. Ipso facto, not a public forum, the government has pretty much carte blanche to regulate speech. Um, Justice Kennedy wrote what was a, a concurrence but effectively a dissent on this issue in which he said that this is all wrong. Um, we do not want to do this sort of categorical analysis in which except for streets and sidewalks, the government gets to do whatever it wants, which is, by the way, currently the law. Um, we need to take an objective approach. When an area is open to the public and it's government owned, the question we should be asking is, is speech consistent with the uses of the property? Is speech going to interfere significantly with the uses of the property, given that you can adopt narrower time, place, and manner regulations to minimize disruption? And if the answer is yes, if speech could be tolerated, then speech must be tolerated. Um, and therefore, he said, under that analysis, this is clearly a public forum, because there's, there are people walking around here like a shopping mall. Distributing literature is not going to interfere with speech in any significant way. Um, the takeaway. Is, is that very early in his career, um, this is just four years after he joined the court, he was taking a very aggressive stance over how we define public forums. Um, that fight hopefully will be won someday. 25 years later, it's still not won yet. Um, but he's taking a very aggressive approach on the theory that more speech is generally better, and also believing that one shouldn't allow fears of disruption to trump free speech claims. The disruption can be managed, right? Um, that's what's going on in, in ISCON. Jump forward 25 years later to Packingham, which um, I'm not going to repeat the facts. Packingham is the North Carolina case from 2017 involving the um, sex offender and the internet. Um, and again, Justice Kennedy starts off his opinion for the majority, striking down this North Carolina statute, banning any sex offenders from accessing social media. But he says that while in the past, he, first he talks about the importance of the public forum. He talks about how democratic dialogue in the public forum is the heartbeat of democracy, and without it, we, democracy cannot continue. And he talks about while in the past it might have been unclear what there may have been difficulty in identifying the most important places in a spatial sense for the exchange of views. Today, the answer is clear. It is cyberspace, the vast democratic forums of the internet in general, and social media in particular. And he goes on to talk about the, the revolution that the internet has created in free speech. Um, and it's an entirely sort of, it's an entirely optimistic opinion. 
Um, and he ends up, of course, striking down the ban because his comment is, is that this is a regulation that effectively cut, takes a group of citizens, sex offender citizens, and completely cuts them off from the social and political life of the country, and that has to be too broad. Um, and again, it's two lessons from this. One, optimism about technology. Um, you can contrast this to the separate opinion by Justice Alito, which is basically expresses sort of deep, dark fears about what technology is going to do and how it can be used in an abusive for form. Packingham, the Kennedy majority, very optimistic about technology and its hopes. And second, once again, suggesting that you don't let deep, dark fears trump free speech. Um, you need to have something more tangible just that then something may happen someday. The third case, uh, Rosenberger versus Rectors of, U of University of Virginia, involved a program at the UV at UVA in which um, basically the university paid for the printing costs of student publications, but it excluded publications that primarily promotes or manifests a particular belief in or about a deity or an ultimate reality. It was a religious exception. And a group of students who wanted to publish a magazine called Wide Awake, which provided a Christian perspective on social and political issues, were excluded from the program. Um, Kennedy says that the Student Activities Fund, which is the funding program that paid for the printing costs, was a forum, albeit in a metaphysical sense rather than a spatial or geographic one. In that sense, I think Rosenberger sort of is the predecessor of Packingham and the very infancy of the internet. The idea that we should treat the concept of forums broadly, not just as streets and sidewalks, but as places where speech is created and we should be maximizing speech. Um, and then he concluded that the exclusion of religious publications constituted viewpoint discrimination and that including the publication would not violate the Establishment Clause. I'm not going to get into the Establishment Clause. But the key point is, if we viewpoint discrimination, you want to have all voices open. Once again, I think the lessons are define forums broadly. Second, all speech is valuable and all perspectives should be heard. And third, just because you have limited resources, because that was the excuse that UVA was, one of the reasons UVA was putting forward, doesn't mean that you can pick and choose what speech you, you fund in, in, based on viewpoint. Finally, a seeming counterexample that is not, I think, a case called Arkansas Educational Television Commission versus Forbes. Um, AETC is a state agency that owns a um, bunch of public TV stations in Arkansas. It was hosting a congressional debate um, for, for candidates for 1992 um, congressional elections. Um, and it's decided it was only going to include major party candidates and candidates who had significant, had strong support, significant support. And on that basis, they excluded Forbes, who had qualified for the ballot, but they concluded did not have any significant support. He sued and he lost um, in an opinion written by Justice Kennedy. Um, Justice Kennedy said, we can't treat public TV stations as public forums because Part of journalism is controlling content and editing content. <coughs> and if you impose some sort of a viewpoint neutrality um, or, um, position on them, they won't be able to control how they present facts. And that has to be right, by the way. If a public TV station has a, has a um, documentary about the Holocaust, they don't have to give Nazis equal time. That, that has to be right. Um, but he conceded the debate is different. In the debate, viewpoint discrimination would be problematic because after all the debate is an opportunity for candidates to speak but his comment was the view that the eighth circuit had adopted which was all qualified candidates had a constitutional right to participate in the debate actually was not speech enhancing it was potentially speech reducing for two reasons one if you have eight ten twelve candidates sitting there all of whom would get equal time the candidates that actually might get elected get reduced to two minutes. And so you're really, they don't have a chance to say their, their say, which is a problem. And I think about this, I'm gonna think about the early debates in the 2016 Republican nomination race when there were 20 people up there and a proof of the pudding, proof of the pudding, right? Um, <coughs> Wait till the Democrats next time. <laughs> That's gonna be, exactly. <laughs> um, and he also said that given, if really if these TV stations who want to, to put on these debates because Commercial TV stations do not do debates for congressional elections. If you give them the option of everyone has to be included or you have a First Amendment problem, they may well cancel the debates altogether, which in fact happened in um, following in the Nebraska TV station after that. And I think what we learned, so, and I think this is correct, even though this decision is anti-free speech, I think it actually is correct. And he, I think what it illustrates is, is that sometimes, 
in order to, ma to maximize speech, you actually have to restrain speech. Um, that is not often, not usually, but occasionally. Um, what do I get from all of this? I think one thing is Justice Kennedy's usual instinct, Garcetti notwithstanding, and I think Garcetti is problematic, I agree with you. Um, usually, maximizing speech is better than minimizing speech. And the reason for that is A, speech is good, but B, we have to trust listeners to be able to sort out valuable from not valuable speech. We have to trust listeners to be able to figure out what they believe. We have to trust listeners to find out what they need to find out. Um, and by listeners, I mean citizens. And we shouldn't be worried about drowning out, frankly, because people will figure out who to take seriously or not. So that if it's corporate speech, as long as you have disclosure requirements, they'll figure it out. Um, and that sometimes you have to think hard about whether or not protecting speech enhances or undermines public debate. Um, and I think that's, that insight sort of drives, whether you not want to agree with it, that insight is a very libertarian approach towards free speech, right? It's a every, basically no rules um, in most contexts. <coughs> a couple of things about that. One, I think that approach explains his approach towards commercial speech. He wrote a case called Sorrell versus IMS Health in 2011, in which he struck down a Vermont, eh, it's Vermont or New Hampshire, one, Vermont. New England, Vermont statute, um, which prohibited the use of basically data regarding how doctors prescribe medications. The data was being bought by pharmaceutical companies and used to sell, um, to basically to market to doctors. And he, he, for a six justice court, struck down the case. And basically, he hinted that he thought big data was speech and deserved First Amendment protection. Um, big deal. Um, though he didn't hold that. Um, and then he held that commercial speech deserves protection and here, all you're doing is restricting advertising and there's no reason to do that because this advertising is not in any way um, misleading or false. Again, I think if you trust doctors to not be flim-flammed by pharmaceutical companies, which you know, hopefully one does because they're prescribing the medication, um, then there's really no reason to restrict commercial speech. I happen to disagree with this particular holding, but it's consistent, I think. Citizens United. Same deal. I think in Citizens United, the question is, should we be concerned that corporate speech will drown out everybody else and people will be completely fooled and believe that in fact, Facebook is your friend or you know, GM is your friend? Um, yeah, maybe, but I don't think so. I think especially in the context of democratic debates, the idea that we don't trust citizens to work out who to listen to and who not is pretty inconsistent with the assumptions of popular sovereignty that drive our system. Um, so that in, in the context of political speech like Citizens United, I actually think the decision is correct. You, know, you do have to trust people um, and not worry about drowning out and figure out, figure out it'll all work out. So, in closing, I want to pose a problem. Obviously, going forward, um, the internet is going to change everything. I mean, I, Justice Kennedy said that he thinks none of, none of current free speech law is going to survive unchanged. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what I do for a living is point out I think that's right. Um, and here's the problem. Packingham talks about the, the public forum being the internet today and social media. And that's great, but there's a problem. Um, and the problem is, of course, that the public forum doctrine was written with government-owned property in mind. But Mark Zuckerberg ain't the government, and neither is Twitter. How far is Twitter from here? Three blocks? Um, so. They're not really public forums in the traditional sense because they are privately owned. And this creates a conundrum that we don't really know quite what to do with. And the conundrum, I mean, there's many, many conundrums, but the conundrum is this. Right now, social media censors a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. It's an industry. Um, and people criticize, it's very funny, people criticize Facebook for being really, really bad and then they want them to censor more. Um, I'm going to think about those two thoughts and to realize there's a problem here. Um, there's a fun, I mean, like people, the critics of Facebook need to make up their mind. Either Facebook's really bad and should not be censoring, or it's great and it should be censoring away, but the combination makes no sense. Um, and here's the problem. If we're serious about 
these being the new public fora, it suggests that we should pull a Marsh versus Alabama and extend First Amendment type protections to speech on these forums, which means that you know, hate speech on Facebook is fully protected. And there's at least some suggestion in Packingham that maybe that's what we should be thinking about. He didn't say it, but he didn't reach the issue. But there's also a problem, which is historically we've always understood that private owners of media, like the editors of the New York Times or the owners of AETC, have a right to manage their speech and their, their, their platform. Indeed, it's a First Amendment editorial right. Um, and that that right, in fact, enhances speech because it does not force the New York Times every time they write an editorial criticism of President Trump, i.e. every day, to give equal, equal time to the other side. And Mark Zuckerberg is a media owner, right? Twitter's a media platform. And so here you have the, the, the insight from AETC, which is sometimes control enhances debate, clashing with the insight from Packingham, which is the internet is the new public forum, and so we should let a uh, hundred flowers bloom, is that the, 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 the mouse thing? Yeah. And those two ideas both seem great, and they're entirely incompatible with each other. Um, and moving forward, I think, and both principles, I think, are correct. Um, but moving forward, we don't know what to do. Frankly, if you look at all of the press coverage, all of the protests, all of the this, all of the that, the answer is no one knows what to do. No one knows how to reconcile these two principles. And, um, you know, we're going to spend the next quarter of a century figuring that one out. Um, at which time I'll be retired and it'll be your problem. Thank you. <laughs> Thank wow, you. It, this Thank is so fantastic to be on this wonderful panel and in this incredible symposium. I want to thank and congratulate everybody who has worked on it, including my primary contact, who was Nina Gliozo. I saw her somewhere around here. Uh, many, many times. And I also want to thank my long-standing former ACLU colleague, Matt Coles, who is on your faculty now. <laughs> Matt is justly celebrated as a pioneering leader on issues surrounding gay rights and uh, gender identity. I'm not sure it's as well known what an essential leader he's been on the whole broad civil liberties agenda, which is defending all fundamental freedoms for all people. And I want to stress that because it ties directly into a theme that Nina asked me to discuss about Justice Kennedy's jurisprudence, namely his support even for hate speech, I put it in quotes because there's no official uh, definition, but speech that disparages people who have traditionally been subject to discrimination. Nina kindly invited me to focus on this issue because it's the topic of a recent book that I wrote. Uh, so let me give you a thumbnail sketch of my book's conclusions and more importantly of Justice Kennedy's pertinent opinions. A major reason why I oppose censoring hate speech flows from the actual track record of such censorship. The evidence shows that censorship is at best ineffective and at worst counterproductive in advancing the goals of countering hatred and discrimination. Um, and often these laws that are intended to benefit traditionally excluded or marginalized minority groups in fact do exactly the opposite. Conversely, obviously, we have a huge amount of work in front of us to advance meaningful equality and dignity and justice, but the progress that we have made has been due to a robust freedom of speech that is sufficiently robust to extend to hate speech. And that is a point that Justice Kennedy stressed in his last pertinent Supreme Court opinion in the court's most recent hate speech decision, Mattal versus Tam in 2017. In that case, the court unanimously struck down a provision in the federal trademark law that denied trademark protection uh, that the enforcing officials deemed to be disparaging 
to minority groups. The court's opinion, which was by Justice Alito, stressed time-honored First Amendment principles that shield freedom even for the thought that we hate, and the court, of course, uh, quoted Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' famous phrase. Justice Kennedy wrote a separate concurring opinion. And in that, he stressed that members of minority groups have the most to lose from censoring hate speech. Here's what he said. A law that can be directed against speech found offensive to some portion of the public can be turned against minority and dissenting views to the detriment of all. The First Amendment does not entrust that power to the government's benevolence. Instead, and this ties in with Asha's comments, instead our reliance must be on the substantial safeguards of free and open discussion in a democratic society. Indeed, the facts of the Mattel case itself illustrate Justice Kennedy's insights. The censored speakers were themselves members of a minority group who were using a traditional slur in order to assert their ethnic pride by reclaiming that term. Uh, specifically, an Asian American rock musician, Simon Tam, and his fellow Asian American band, me band members proudly called their band the Slants. So when the Supreme Court protected that choice, it was simultaneously respecting not only their free speech rights, but also their equality and their dignity. Uh, likewise, advocates of LGBT rights have often explained that these rights have been especially dependent on robust free speech principles. Matt uh, has made that point many times. Given the reinforcing nature of declaring one's identity and demanding one's equality. So I think it's fitting that Justice Kennedy has been celebrated as a preeminent champion of both free speech and LGBT rights. Uh, moreover, the overarching theme of government neutrality also links other areas of Justice Kennedy's jurisprudence. The notion that government must remain neutral toward all ideas and toward all people. That theme pervaded his last major majority, one of his last major majority opinions for the court in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. He insisted that businesses open to the general public must neutrally serve all people regardless of their sexual orientation as mandated by the Colorado Public Accommodations Law. Likewise, he insisted that government must neutrally evaluate claims for exemptions from that law based on religious beliefs. In that case, he concluded that the exemption claim had not received a neutral consideration because government officials had shown a clear hostility toward the pertinent religious beliefs. I'm not necessarily agreeing with the factual analysis, but I think the principles were absolutely correct. Uh, in my remaining time, I'm going to comment further about the two facets of Justice Kennedy's First Amendment views that Nina encouraged me to focus on. First, his extremely strong support for his concept of neutrality in the free speech context, and second, his evolving views about how to honor the concept of neutrality in the Establishment Clause context, as manifested by his seemingly dramatic shift between the Allegheny case in 1989 and Lee versus Weissman in 1992. So starting with free speech, uh, of course, all of the justices in recent history have supported the general content neutrality principle, but they often disagree about specific implementing details. Uh, in my limited time, I'm going to just focus on one aspect of Justice Kennedy's jurisprudence in this regard, and that is that in a couple of cases, he opined that 
content-based regulation should be absolutely automatically unconstitutional. Of course, under the court's established doctrine, um, they are presumptively unconstitutional, subject to strict scrutiny. It's hard for the government to satisfy the appropriately demanding strict scrutiny standard, but that is not impossible. Um, Justice, one of Justice Kennedy's opinions in which he uh, strongly supported content neutrality, of course, is Citizens United. And I think what's interesting about that is he explained that not discriminating against speakers, including speakers that happen to be organized in the form of, by the way, not only for-profit corporations, but also non-for-profit, non-profit corporations and unions were also protected. People uh, tend to forget that. He said, speech restrictions based on the identity of the speaker are all too often simply a means to control content. The government may not, by these means, deprive the public of the right to determine for itself, again, the theme that, that I stressed, uh, to determine for itself what speech and speakers are worthy of consideration. Now, in some cases, of of course, I agree with Irwin, Justice Kennedy took less speech protective positions than other justices, uh, with the sole exception of Citizens United, I and the ACLU uh, agree with Irwin's critique of the uh, cases that he listed. Morse versus Frederick was, in fact, uh, a direct ACLU case in which we championed uh, Frederick Morse's free speech rights. Um, that said, from the standpoint of free speech advocates, no justice has had a perfect record. Certainly not including Hugo Black, who is so often described as a free speech absolutist, but to cite one of many counterexamples, another ACLU case involving student free speech, where fortunately we won, but Hugo Black wrote a, a, a vitriolic dissent in Tinker versus Des Moines School District which, by the way, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary um, this year. So I think, on the whole, it is fair uh, to describe Justice Kennedy, and here I'm quoting First Amendment lawyer, prominent First Amendment lawyer Floyd Abrams. Uh, after Justice Kennedy announced his retirement, Floyd wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal, which was entitled uh, First Amendment Champion. And he said, Justice Kennedy was the Supreme Court's most dedicated, consistent, and eloquent defender of the First Amendment. He played that role both when other conservatives rejected First Amendment arguments and when liberals did. And I'm going to give some counterexamples to Irwin when uh, we have time for discussion. But um, in my opening remarks, I want to turn to the two Establishment Clause opinions by Justice Kennedy. Um, that I agreed to discuss. The 1989 dissent in Allegheny County versus Greater Pittsburgh ACLU and his 1992 majority opinion in Lee versus Weissman. I have to say they're generally important cases, but I'm particularly interested in both of them because both of them were ACLU cases in which we were both a client and both a party and uh, counsel. Uh, they challenged government-sponsored religious displays or religious exercises under the Establishment Clause. We won a partial victory in Allegheny and a complete victory in Lee. Now, before I say more about Justice Kennedy's opinions in these cases, I want to quote a distinguished lawyer, professor, and media commentator, <coughs> Harry Littman, uh, who is with us today as a former Kennedy clerk. And Harry was clerking for Justice Kennedy when the court ruled on the Allegheny case. Uh, the outstanding lawyer and ACLU leader who argued the Allegheny case was my longtime friend and colleague, Roz Littman, none other than Harry's mother. Uh, so Harry kindly gave me permission to share with you the following excerpt from an email he sent me about this uh, landmark argument. He said, I had the ultra strange experience 
of being like a parent watching his child in his school play, but in reverse. I had to sit there keeping my cool while hanging on every word and metaphorically biting my nails. Um, in Allegheny, the court struck down one of two challenge government-sponsored displays of religious symbols during the winter holiday season, although it upheld the second such display. In Lee, the court struck down a school-sponsored graduation prayer. In both cases, the justices were deeply split and wrote impassioned opinions. In Allegheny, Justice Kennedy concluded that both of the challenge displays should have been upheld, and he condemned the court striking down of one of these displays in very harsh language. He accused the court of harboring either a latent hostility or a callous indifference toward religion, and that prompted a very strong response from Harry Blackman, who had authored the court's opinion. Uh, Blackman wrote, Justice Kennedy's accusations are as offensive as they are absurd. Justice Kennedy apparently has misperceived a respect for religious pluralism as hostility or indifference to religion. No misperception could be more antithetical to the values embodied in the Establishment Clause. Well, given that opinion, it wasn't surprising that Justice Kennedy, three years later in Lee versus Wiseman, after the oral argument, voted to reject the ACLU's challenge to government-sponsored graduation prayers. In fact, Chief Justice Rehnquist assigned Justice Kennedy to write the majority opinion upholding such prayers. However, having drafted such an opinion, Justice Kennedy concluded that it looked quite wrong, to quote the note that he sent to Justice Blackman. Uh, Justice Kennedy explained that he was reaching out to Justice Blackman in light of the barbs between the two of us in their prior opinions, and this is all very edifying in light of the comments Justice Kennedy made during that wonderful conversation about reaching out and having civil discourse despite really strong disagreements. So his assigned majority opinion rejecting the Establishment Clause challenge instead morphed into a majority opinion that upheld that challenge. And I think this is a wonderful object lesson in being open-minded and always rethinking, which he also talked about during that conversation. So substantively, his opinion striking down the school-sponsored prayer stressed his consistent theme of government neutrality, right? Just as government may neither favor nor disfavor any idea in the free speech context, it may neither favor nor disfavor any belief in the religion uh, context. And without even knowing that he was the one who used this line, whenever I'm explaining the religion clauses, I always quote a line that I discovered he wrote in that opinion. Religious beliefs and religious expression are too precious to be either proscribed or prescribed by the government. I think it's a fabulous uh, summary of what the law is about. And even in the Allegheny case, he had also stressed the principle of neutrality. It's just that his idea of what actually constituted neutrality evolved so that in Lee, he came around to Justice Blackmun's position that enforcing the establishment, curbing the government from endorsing religion is actually a neutral position rather than a hostile uh, position. So I'd like to close with uh, one of Justice Kennedy's statements that most eloquently captures this fundamental overarching theme. It comes from his majority opinion in the 1997 Turner Broadcasting case. At the heart of the First Amendment, lies the principle that each person should decide for himself or herself the ideas and beliefs deserving of expression, consideration, and adherence. Our political system and cultural life rest upon this ideal.
Thank you. Uh, so we're, we're going to go a little over. This, was, this panel was scheduled to end at noon. We got started a little late. So we're going to end this panel at about 1215. I'm not asking anybody's permission because I don't see anybody from who I could ask uh, permission. Uh, so we're just going to do it. And uh, I said okay. <laughs> Great. Oh, we're, there he is. Professor Little said, okay. So um, we're going to have a discussion among ourselves for about 15 minutes, and then for the last 15 minutes, I'll open it up to audience questions. So let me ask Dean Chemerinsky, do you have any reactions to what Professor Bagwat and <laughs> Professor Strassen uh, said? There's obviously much we agree about, but I want to focus on two areas of disagreement. First, I very much disagree with Nadine's characterization that Justice Kennedy took a neutrality approach to the Establishment Clause. Justice Kennedy took a very weak approach to the Establishment Clause, where very little would violate it for him. Let me point to his last majority opinion on the court in Town of Greece versus Galloway in the Establishment Clause context. It involves a town in upstate New York for a 20-year period, except for four months, always invited Christian clergy to deliver prayers, and virtually always explicitly Christian prayers. The Supreme Court, an opinion by Justice Kennedy, five to four said it didn't violate the Establishment Clause. Or a couple of cases before that in 2005, Van Orden versus Perry, and McCurry County versus ACLU, that involved Ten Commandments displays. Van Orden versus Perry involves a six foot high, three foot wide Ten Commandments display that's at the exact corner of the Texas State Capitol and the Texas Supreme Court. I argued that case on behalf of Thomas Van Orden. And at the oral argument, Justice Kennedy said, with real hostility in his voice, if your client doesn't like the Ten Commandments monument, why doesn't he look the other way? Of course, my answer was, we don't excuse constitutional violations by ignoring them. And there's no stopping point to that. A city could put a large Latin cross on City Hall and say, just look the other way. In fact, in Allegheny County, in the opinion that Dean mentions, he said the government violates the Establishment Clause only if it literally established a church or coerces religious participation. That leaves little to violate the Establishment Clause. I can identify only two cases where he found something to violate an Establishment Clause. One was Lee versus Weissman, and the other was he was in the majority in Santa Fe Independent School District versus Doe. Both were school prayer cases, and he was willing to find coercion in the school context that he wasn't in other contexts. But Justice Kennedy was not a neutrality theorist with regard to the Establishment Clause. Rarely did he find something to violate it. Second, in terms of speech, the conclusion I came to in my remarks is that Justice Kennedy would often compromise his commitment to free speech when it was inconsistent with his other conservative values. Let me point to two cases we haven't discussed and contrast them. One is Planned Parenthood versus Casey from 1992. We always remember it for Justice Kennedy being part of the majority to reaffirm Roe versus Wade. But we might forget is part of the Pennsylvania law there required that doctors give specific information to women before the abortion could be performed. Among the things that had to be told women was that a list of adoption providers was available, that descriptions of the fetus at that stage of pregnancy were available. The court, with Justice Kennedy and the majority, rejected a free speech challenge to that and upheld that requirement in the Pennsylvania law. Even though it was compelled speech, Justice Kennedy was not on the speech side. On the other hand, on June 26th of 2018, in National Institute of Family and Life Advocates versus Becerra, the Supreme Court, with Justice Kennedy and the majority, said a preliminary injunction should have been issued against a California law that required facilities that provide reproductive health care post notices saying the state of California provides free and low-cost abortion and contraception for women who economically qualify, and unlicensed facilities have to disclose that. Justice Kennedy there was say, part of the majority saying that's impermissible compelled speech. I don't know how to reconcile those two cases. In Planned Parenthood, the court was allowing doctors to be required to utter speech. In the Nifla versus Becerra, it was just posting a notice on the wall with true factual information. Mm -hmm. To me, the difference, it was just a majority that was hostile to abortion rights in Nicola versus Becerra, and a majority that was willing to allow restrictions to try to discourage abortion in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. To me, it reflects how Justice Kennedy would compromise his free speech values when it was inconsistent with his conservative precepts. All right. Well, Professor Strassen or Professor Bagwat, do you want to rise to Justice Kennedy's defense? 
uh, not on Becerra. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I thought was quite clearly wrong. Um, I do think that there's a commonality, Morse versus Frederick, Lee versus Wiseman, and I think the difference is kids. Um, I think that maybe we need to think a little bit more about adults versus kids, um, in the sense that you can, one can believe that adults should avert their eyes from holiday displays in Allegheny or Ten Commandments in, um, in the, 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 the Ten Commandments cases, it's so hard, and still think that children are different and that children should not be subject to religious indoctrination by the state, but that at the same time, given the pedagogical function of schools, schools need more control over children's speech within school functions than would otherwise be true. Um, I, you know, whether I, you agree with that or not, and I don't know if I do or not, frankly, um, I don't think there's an inconsistency there. Plan Casey versus Becker, I completely agree there's an inconsistency. There's a problem. Um, part of the problem was is that I clerked in 1992. I suspect that um, the mandatory disclosure part of the, the statute got very little attention because there was so much else going on. Um, but the problem is, is that we, of course, require doctors to disclose things all the time. That's a fundamental part of the law of malpractice and the law of regulation of doctors. Um, and usually it's unproblematic, right? I mean, these are the risks of this surgical procedure. And no one would think that that's, a, I hope no one would think that that's a First Amendment violation. Um, no one would think that's a First Amendment violation. So the problem is, what do you do when that disclosure requirement starts shading into ideology, which was the problem in Casey and the problem in Becerra? And I don't have a good answer to that. It's, it's, I'm reminded of this litigation that's been going on in Florida over the doc, docs and glocks, in which basically doctors were forbidden to ask their patients about gun ownership, um, pediatricians were. And the law got struck down eventually, but after like five different opinions. It's really hard because we regulate the professions a lot um, and historically regulations have been, you know, just for the benefit of patients. We don't do that anymore. Everything is politicized now, including apparently medical regulations. So what do you do? So I'm certainly not here to, uh, you know, defend Justice Kennedy's entire record. Uh, and I agree with all of the critiques that Irwin made of the ca various cases with the sole exception, again, of um, Citizens United. I'm very fascinated, so I'm going to make a couple other points, but I'm, I'm fascinated and I apologize, Ash, that I have not read your empirical analysis. Part of me is asking, well, who is less bad or who has a, you know, better uh, overall record in terms of the First Amendment? So who was second on your list? I don't, you, don't I don't re remember. you don't remember that. Um, and it's Sitting here you know, so there, I can figure it out. There are, you know, <laughs> I, I do think that Irwin, the charge that he is consistently preferring conservative values is demonstrably untrue off the top of my, I'll give you two counter, you know, you're very, you give great counter examples. I think this shows everybody is so complex, it's really hard to make generalizations. But here are two counter examples to the plausible charge that he preferred conservative values over free speech values. One is in the flag burning case, Texas versus Johnson, and the subsequent one. Uh, but Texas versus Johnson, he was very new on the court, and he obviously was agonized about it, because in addition to casting his vote to support the five-person majority, that held that there is a First Amendment right, and that was extremely controversial. Let me remind the young people in this audience that the then President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, I believe on the very next day, proposed a constitutional amendment, uh, which, by the way, very quickly received three quarters of the votes of states, so we have enough states to ratify it, uh, received two-thirds of the vote, uh, more than two-thirds by far, across the aisle of the United States House of Representatives, and the last time the Senate voted on it, it fell one vote short of the two-thirds majority. So this is deeply unpopular, but especially with conservatives. And in addition to joining the majority opinion, Kennedy wrote a very agonized, brief concurrence in which he explained how problematic and painful it is 
to implement principle in a particularly disturbing factual context. So I give him a lot of credit for that. Uh, the other example, and this is interesting because it does relate to children. That was kind of an interesting hypothesis, Ash. Um, uh, Ashcroft, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, Ashcroft versus, it was the Child Pornography Protection Act, which outlawed so-called virtual child pornography. It looked like child pornography, it could have been advertised as child pornography, but it did not, in fact, use an actual minor in its production. And that was a real nail biter, friends. I asked one of my research assistants uh, to go back and look at the track record because my impression had been, and proved to be correct, that every single lower court judge who ruled on that statute, including many prominent liberals, every single one of them found a way to reject the First Amendment challenge to that statute. I mean, I think it would be very unpopular today, but then even more so because we were going through a particular moral panic uh, about the problem of child sex abuse. So the fact that Kennedy writes an opinion and becomes one of the very first judges in the entire, and there were at least a, something like a dozen different lower court judges had ruled on this and, and managed to reject the First Amendment challenge. So I give him, uh, and you know, Catholic, conservative, um, being accused of being soft on child pornography, I give him a lot of credit for political courage on that. Um, I do think that with respect to Becerra, there's, I'll take a term that has usually been used by the other side, uh, that is those who uh, oppose reproductive freedom. It may have been uh, Justice Scalia who coined the phrase abortion distortion. I think on both sides, the issue is just so fraught there tend to be departures from usual principles when the particular issue involves abortion. The other thing about Justice Kennedy, I have to say, that may have been relevant in Morse is his virulently anti-drug stance. And here, um, Erwin, you'll remember the name of the case, uh, a Fourth Amendment case, uh, where uh, an ACLU young client got challenged to mandatory suspicionless drug testing was rejected uh, with Kennedy joining. And, and during the oral argument, and our client was just this really sweet, innocent kid from somewhere in the Midwest who wouldn't even know what a drug looked like. Uh, she was goody-goody two-shoes. She just really believed that it was wrong for the government to insist on mandatory drug tests as a precondition for being in the school choir, uh, which she was participating in. And during the oral argument, you can look it up, Kennedy was so insulting to our lawyer and to our client, he literally referred to her as a druggie, that only druggies would be uh, concerned about mandatory drug testing. And um, some, I actually noticed somebody wrote a blog in which they said, you know, Kennedy is so consistently hostile to drugs and will warp all of his views, including on the Commerce Clause, I mean, you name it, uh, that somebody was even arguing maybe he ought, ought to be disqualified or you ought to ask him to recuse himself from cases having to do with drugs. Let me push back on that a little. Uh, <laughs> I, feel, I feel the urge to protect my former boss. Uh, in Morris versus Frederick, the bong hits for Jesus. Uh, I think it's important to recognize two things. One is, the, what the majority construed the banner bong hits for Jesus to be advocating for drug use. And is that an unreasonable interpretation? No. Jesus is good. The banner said bong hits for Jesus, so we want to do something nice for Jesus, and therefore you should do, <laughs> you should do what Jesus does and take bong hits. So it, it's, that's not an unreasonable interpretation. And I can for, see why you were such a successful law, trial lawyer. <laughs> the court, so the court was saying you can't, it, it's okay for the school to punish advocating drug use. And there's really nothing wrong with that. But I think what's the, the more important point is that Justice Kennedy joined a concurrence by Justice Alito. Uh, 
And Justice Alito was very careful to say, and Justice Kennedy agreed, because uh, he joined the concurrence, that what we're talking about is advocating drug use. If you, what is protected is if you want to advocate for a change in the drug laws, that's protected First Amendment speech, but advocating for drug use is not, and I thought that was a very important qualification in the Morris case. Can I dissent, Judge? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, we punish speech if it advocates illegal activity only if there's a substantial likelihood of imminent illegality and only if the speech is directed at causing imminent illegality. There was no showing that the speech in this case would have the slightest effect in encouraging illegal drug use or causing illegal drug use. Um, and I think the, the cases that Nadine points to, Board of Potawatomi School District versus Earls, involving this girl in Lindsay Oklahoma, Earls, right. or Justice Kennedy's majority opinion gets me at our panel, in Maryland versus King, saying that the police can take DNA from a suspect if he's arrested for serious crime, and see it matches unsolved crime police databases. I think that that fits much more an anti-drug approach than it does the theory of the advocacy one that you argue. Well, let, let me ask one more question, and th this will be the last question among us, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel. Uh, so Justice Kennedy has left the court, replaced by Justice uh, Kavanaugh. Um, do you think that Justice Kennedy's replacement by Justice Kavanaugh will affect the court's First Amendment jurisprudence in any way? And, uh, and I guess not to make too fine a point on it, uh, are there any areas, First Amendment areas, where Justice Kennedy was the fifth vote where you think that there's a chance that Justice Kavanaugh will see things differently? I actually, yes. Um, I'm going to give you one example, which terrifies me. Um, when the, net, the Obama administration net neutrality rules were um, challenged in front of the DC Circuit, um, they were upheld, but um, then Judge Kavanaugh dissented. And you know, the, the, the administrative telecom issues only I care about um, in the world, I think. But, um, but Judge Kavanaugh bought an argument made by one of the smaller telecom companies that it would violate their First Amendment rights, internet service providers' First Amendment rights, to prevent them from censoring material that you can access on the internet. That is a corporatist approach towards the First Amendment that is, I, I, I found it baffling, um, but all, and clearly wrong for many reasons. But really, I mean, if, if one goes to that length in terms of corporations and their powers, Regulating Facebook's out of the, the question, right? I mean, if, if, if Comcast has First Amendment rights, Facebook, which is an actual platform, is going to have infinite First Amendment rights. So, yeah, I think that's going to be a big shift. Anyone else? I think so many of the speech cases that are going to come in the future involve what Justice Kagan referred to in her dissent in Janus is weaponizing the First Amendment. This is the instance of using free speech as a basis for challenging social and economic regulations. NIFLA versus Becerra being an example, the Sorrell case that you mentioned being an example, Janice certainly being an example. In, in these cases, there are usually five, four decisions with the conservative justice in the majority and the more liberal justice in dissent. And I think here, probably Justice Kavanaugh will vote the same way as Justice Kennedy, which I think in these are going to be the most important cases, you're not going to see a shift. Professor Strassen? I have nothing to add, but uh, Floyd Abrams wrote a paper in which he analyzed, all, and you can easily find it online, he's a great expert on the First Amendment, in which he analyzed uh, Justice Kavanaugh's record, which I highly recommend. All right. So why don't, I, uh, why don't we open it up to the floor if, if you would like to ask a question. <laughs> I think we have two microphones. Is that, are those what those microphones are for? I believe so. Yeah. Oh. All right. <laughs> Uh, so I have a great discussion. I had a question to start off, I guess, mainly for Professor Bogwat, but others also. I think when it comes to social media, what do you think of the idea that um, the government should be free to regulate them as common carriers? I, I mean, so think about Facebook. It seems to me it's a lot like other natural monopolies. Right? There was going to be a Facebook. It just someone got there first, and then they can kind of exclude other platforms. And so they may be exercising a kind of editorial function when they're creating their algorithmic news feed or something like that, but if they're just providing a platform for other speech, uh, you know, whether Congress or whoever chooses to do so is another question, but shouldn't they be free to say you're, you're, you're effectively a common carrier, you don't have a First Amendment protection against that type of regulation? So this is the issue that I just mentioned, right? I mean, I, I have a, both a practical and a sort of First Amendment response. As a practical response, I think we're th we need to think about it, but I don't think it's going to work. 
Um, and the reason is, is, is they have to have some sort of algorithm to control your feed. Um, and that algorithm can't be content neutral because, you know, I'm not really interested in seeing posts from, you know, people I've never heard of around the world. Um, and the, the feed, otherwise, you would just drown. Um, and so I think that's, that's one difficulty. But you could, for example, impose viewpoint neutrality requirements. I don't know whether it is e the better analogy. I think Comcast, the analogy is the telephone company, and that's why I think that Judge Kavanaugh was just wrong in suggesting they have editorial rights. With Facebook, whether they are more like the New York Times or more like AT&T is not obvious to me. Um, and because AT&T, you, you can regulate as a common carrier, we do. Um, New York Times, what the court has said already, you can't do that. You can't tell newspapers, you know, newspapers have editorial rights, you can't strip them of them. Um, that the right of reply case, which name I'm currently blanking on from the 70s. Um, Miami Herald versus Ternillo. Thank you, yeah. Ternillo. Um, and I don't know what the right answer is. Um, because after all, daily newspapers were also monopolies, right? So the fact that they're a monopoly doesn't so all solve the problem. I think this is a, you know, just the most difficult issue. I've been thinking about it not nearly as much as Osh has, but I, uh, I've been, you know, to me the question is what is the lesser of two evils allowing, in, in some ways what we have with the social media companies is the worst of both worlds because as Justice Kennedy recognized in Packingham, for all practical purposes, they have more power and have exercised more sensorial power than all of the governments in history around the world, and yet they are not cabined in exercising that power by the First Amendment, the Due Process Clause, and so forth. And um, I've found very helpful, in addition to scholarly writing, writing by the EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, and one of the things that they've pointed out, and others have as well, is that there are different la layers, right, of actors, and the deeper you get into the infrastructure, the stronger the argument is, and the fewer First Amendment problems, that this is really analogous to police and fire and water, and everybody <laughs> has to have it. And the closer you get to content, the closer they are to traditional media with their own First Amendment rights. I would actually add something in turn, ask everyone a question. At this. So you quoted um, Brandenburg, which is the incitement case when you were talking about Morris versus Frederick. I, you know, if we make Facebook into social media, then terrorist recruitment becomes fully protected speech unless you can satisfy Brandenburg, which you can't. Um, what do you think about that? Like, should, is Brandenburg gonna survive the internet? Yes, I think so. Um, you know, Brandenburg is a product of decades of the Supreme Court struggling with the test for incitement. And starting with Shank and Debs and going to Whitney and going to Dennis. And I think that Brandenburg got it right, that the government should be able to punish speech that advocates illegal activity only if it meets a very restrictive test. Substantial likelihood of imminent illegality and directed at causing imminent illegality. And I think that's the test that should be used and will be used with regard to the internet as well. So descriptively, I think Brandenburg will survive. Normatively, I think it should survive. Do we have any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That's happened before, don't worry. Um, <laughs> so to what extent does the Communications Decency Act um, and its limitation of liability for things like defamation distinguish um, the internet from like the New York Times? And how does that play into the issues that you're talking about, about whether we treat it as a common carrier or whether we distinguish between its own content. I, I'm just curious about your thoughts about that. So you're talking about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, I, I think assume, that's right. Uh, which um, was designed to create an incentive to uh, the online companies to um, engage in editorial uh, screening and selectivity to the extent they wanted to without taking on a response, a liability for third party content. So, uh, with a few exceptions. Uh, recently, Congress passed a law that made a much bigger exception, which is, uh, is worrisome, but it was designed to um, create an incentive to. 
allow as many voices as possible to flourish. Uh, I think that the developments since then, as Ash uh, acknowledged, are the public is the one that is demanding I think overwhelmingly demanding that these companies engage in more sensory, okay, I, I won't use the C word, uh, more, some, the positive way to describe it is more curating. Uh, <laughs> I do have to say though that the track record in how they enforce their so-called community standards is no better than governments. And, for many years now, the ACLU and uh, 77 other civil rights and civil liberties organizations have been complaining to Facebook and others that, surprise, surprise, they're enforcing their rules against hate speech, for example, in ways that disproportionately silence Black Lives Matter activists, pipeline protesters, anybody who's objecting to government abuses of power. Uh, women have complained that the anti-nudity and anti-pornography guidelines are being enforced in a way that's discriminatory against women. I don't know if you noticed that Mark Zuckerberg recently issued a, uh, like a manifesto of uh, Facebook is going to set up its own internal controls. He even talked about last year about creating a Supreme Court uh, for Facebook, so clearly they see the, the handwriting on the wall toward potential government regulation and they're trying to fend it off through uh, instituting internal mechanisms. But I mean, the, at the very least, I think we need to have more transparency, more accountability, more notice, more fairness, opportunity to appeal these decisions. I would add, if we repealed 230 and made Facebook responsible, li vicariously liable, Facebook would be scrubbed of everything except for cat videos. Um, because and maybe even not maybe not even cat videos because of animal cruelty. I don't know. I mean because it's impossible for them to actually know whether when you're posting you're lying about someone, right? How could they how can they know that? I mean, how many how many users do they have? Two billion? Um, so it, it would be the end of everything. Um, that's the short answer. Um, so and that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Rao. Um, yes, so one of the themes I think that came out from this panel is Justice Kennedy's emphasis on neutrality, neutrality towards speech. And I think that's a really laudable objective, um, but I think that what also came through on the panel is sometimes his interpretation of what counts as neutral really seems skewed. Um, and I think that's what you see in Nifla against Becerra. I think you can really explain Justice Kennedy's opinion there by his idea that California um, was engaging in um, a special kind of abortion exceptionalism and being, um, you know, uh, uh, giving, you know, uh, uh, it was not neutral in singling out certain kinds of uh, anti-abortion speakers and regulating them in a way that it wouldn't regulate other speakers. And same thing with his opinion in Masterpiece Cake Shop, where he sees the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, the law of course is neutral, but he sees the Colorado Civil Rights Commission as biased in its application of the law to different kinds of speakers. So I think that Justice Kennedy's uh, theory was right, but it seems to me his vision, and you see that again in the religion Allegheny County case, of what he sees as neutral and what he, um, what he sees as biased. So I wondered if you had thoughts on that. Let me talk about Nifla versus Becerra from a free speech context. The majority opinion by Justice Thomas focuses on one set of speech interests. The interests of these pregnancy crisis counseling centers are not even post the notice on the wall. There's another speech interest involved in that case, too. The ability of the state to make sure that women are able to receive speech and are informed that the state provides free and low-cost contraception and abortion for women who qualify, and that women have the chance to know when a facility is unlicensed to provide health care. There is nothing in Justice Thomas's opinion that acknowledges that there are these competing speech interests. In the way Justice Thomas writes the opinion, it puts every disclosure law ever adopted at risk. Because Justice Thomas begins his opinion by saying that the California law is a content-based restriction on speech because it prescribes the required content of the disclosures. That's true of every disclosure law. 
And now every disclosure law is going to have to meet strict scrutiny until the court caps in. But of course, what that ignores is there is a speech interest served by disclosure laws informing people whatever it is the disclosure law is requiring. So I don't know what neutrality means in this context, but it seems to me what Nifla versus Becerra was is the Supreme Court's majority that's hostile to abortion rights allowing the regulation. And it's certainly not neutral between that and what the court did in Planned Parenthood. Oh, I completely agree with you. That's why I don't understand, with his emphasis upon neutrality, how he could be so obtuse um, to the fact that the He's California... That's okay. <laughs> there, there's, there's another disjunction, which is um, in the masterpiece cake, again, as, as I said in my opening remarks, I applaud the theory, even though I don't agree with how it was applied in particular cases. So in masterpiece, um, he found religious hostility because of comments by two individuals on one commission out of the multiple bodies that were making decisions uh, throughout the process, whereas he joined the majority in the Muslim ban case in not giving any weight to President Trump's repeated statements that evidenced hostility toward Muslims. I, I, there's a there's a worldview problem here, um, which is, is that the reality is that we we live in the opposite of this worldview in the middle of San Francisco. <laughs> but um, there's clearly a worldview out there on the conservative side that there's a war on Christianity going on, um, and that that's sort of what's dr especially in kooky places like California. If you believe that, <laughs> then you interpret the statute in Becerra as being simply an attack on basically Christian pro-lifers, right? I think. I think that abortion disclosure provision in the law is hard because it does start crossing the line into a why don't you just put up billboards. The idea that you can't force a clinic to disclose whether or not they're licensed is nuts, right? It can only be explained by this worldview about the war on abortion, on, on, on Christianity. But just one point in response is, um, in defense of Justice Kennedy, sometimes his application of neutrality, he got it right. In Romer v. Evans, yeah. he saw the bias there. Um, and that was at a time when many people did not see it. Um, so I think that if I think of a grand theme animating his jurisprudence, it is this emphasis on neutrality. And that really brings us beautifully to the next panel um, for the afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I want to I want to thank our, our distinguished and great panelists, Dean Chemerinsky, Professor Bogwat, Professor Strassen. It's been a privilege to uh, serve as your moderator. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for uh, being here and for your excellent questions. And I think our keynote. Go ahead, Nina. You're going to let us know what's next. Yeah, um, just an update on the schedule. So um, we invite you all to share lunch. Um, we have. Uh, sandwiches and snacks outside. Uh, the sandwiches are in room A, which is the classroom that you walked past as you came down the hall to this room. Um, and we're going to reconvene at 12.50 for or Orin Care's uh, lunchtime talk. So thank you so much, and we'll see you again at 12.50. <laughs> oh,